My name is John Hare from Sensible Software and Tower Studios, and you're listening to the Sega Lounge. Welcome to the Sega Lounge, where we celebrate our love for all things Sega, including the games, the music, and the community. I'm your host, KC. Join me as I talk to different guests and learn more about their projects and passion for Sega. Welcome to the Sega Lounge. We are back with episode 175, and man, is this one I'm excited for. Stay tuned! Anyway, I hope you've all been doing well. I have personally been very busy with a lot of stuff happening in my life, including lounge stuff still to come. That said, it's always nice to take some time to play games. I'm currently playing through Like a Dragon Ishin, but had to check out the most recent update to Streets of Rage 4, and I've been squeezing some other games in between sessions of these two on the Steam Deck. By the way, you can expect a whole episode dedicated to Ishin very soon on the Sega Lounge. What have you been playing recently? Got any recommendations? Hit us up on social media and let me know. But enough of that for now, let's talk about this week's guest. This week, I'm thrilled and honored to be joined by industry legend John Hare. Every now and then there are interviews I prepare for which end up taking a whole different direction. This was one of those. John Hare was one of the co-founders of Sensible Software, responsible for such iconic games as Sensible Soccer, Cannon Fodder and Megalomania to name a few. While we did touch on some of those games during our chat, and ended up being more of a very candid and insightful look into the video games industry as a whole from the perspective of a man with decades of experience. What's changed and how does John feel about it? Keep listening to find out and to learn more about his most recent project, Sociable Soccer. And don't miss our not-so-sensible quiz at the end. Hi, John. Welcome to the Sega Lounge. How's Hi. it going? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty nice. We're at the end of the day now, so a bit more relaxed. Yeah, good. yeah. I appreciate you making the time. I know these pleasure. are busy times for you. Uh, but so, and, and it's really a pleasure to have such an industry legend on the show. I know your uh, story and your history with video games and in, in the industry uh-huh. has been well documented at this point. So I won't... Uh, you know, uh, ask you to waste too much time on that. But for people not really familiar with the work that you did um, and how you started, would you like to briefly tell us how you got into video games? Because I know that was not like the first thing you did. You're probably firstly a musician, right? Mm, Kind of, yeah. yeah, When I was younger, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I've always written music. I I play music every day. I have my guitars here. I do that all the time. But when I was... um, 15, I met a friend of mine at school. Um, we became friends, going to a concert, actually. And we started to form a band together. We were in the last, the last year of like senior school in, in, in England. And um, we, uh, we were okay. We were young kids learning, learning how to write songs together, to play guitars and singing and stuff. And, but we um, didn't really have jobs, and uh, well, we did. We kind of both went to college, and we both dropped out of college. And I was working in a supermarket, and I don't know when my friend was working, and, but not really proper jobs we wanted to keep. And we I, we said to, like I said to my father, oh, we're going to be in a band. We'll buy a van. We'll drive around. It'll be fine. But it it wasn't fine, and we didn't really make money doing that. And, uh, <laughs> but my friend learned uh, was a was a technical guy, and he learned taught himself to program. And um, one day I was around his house and we were um, doing some music. And he said, look, I'm doing this. He got a job with a local computer game company. Like we're both about 19 at this stage, 19 years old. And um, and he said, I've got to do some graphics, but I can't do it. And like I'd done art and stuff at college. So I was like, I could do the art part. Let's have a try. So basically I just did some wizards and dragons 
they looked a bit more like dinosaurs in reflection um, in this game. And we, he put it in the game and the guys from the company that he worked for, the local company, said, yeah, we like the art your friend's done. We, maybe we can offer him some work. So then they offered me some work. So we were both working for this same company for about a year, just under a year, about nine months on different projects. And then uh, we got assigned a, a project called Twister uh, together, which was an original game. So we got the opportunity to design a game and do all the, you know, all the, all the game design, all the, the graphics were kind of ours. We were given a theme, a Tron-like, Tron-like game with a woman with big breasts flying in the sky is what we were after this, what we did. Uh, and uh, and we did, a, it was quite a nice little Tron game on a, on a spectrum. Uh, but then we discovered that the people we were working for, we they took 85% of the money and we got 15% of the money. And I can tell you, we did 100% of the work. <laughs> and we're like, you know what? This isn't going to carry on any much longer. So we decided to basically set our own company up. Um, at that time in the UK, it was there was a bit of a job crisis that people were leaving school without work. And um, the government had put into place these schemes that uh, enabled you to um, more easily set up companies which is, was really really good actually uh and because we were young and both living at home we could afford to like get this it gave us a minimal income every week but there was enough to get us going and we uh, we set sensible software up on that basis on what was called a government enterprise scheme back in the uk in 1986 mm-hmm. and our first game parallax just happened to do quite well it was a like a commodore 64 flying around kind of game uh we were very lucky we took we went up to ocean software which was the biggest publisher of his day one of the biggest publishers of the day our first ever day of business they signed our game gave us a check for a thousand pounds in the contract so this was a very lucky break for us terrible contract never got any royalties but got us on our way and then from that after about a year later we did Whizball, which was mm-hmm. later acclaimed by zap to be the game of the decade on the commodore 64 which is a mm-hmm. high claim for us so that was our second game on our own and by this time we're still doing music but we're we realise that the games is what's earning us the money. The music is still fun. You know? It's always been the theme of my life, really. And um, and then we did a bunch of other games. We did Shoot 'Em Up Construction Kit. That was our first number one game. Then we did Micro Soccer, um, a game called 3D Tennis, which was a bit odd, but it was doing 3D on the Commodore 64, which we also bridged to the Amiga. Then the Amiga, our first game was Megalomania. We did WizKid, uh, then Sensible Soccer, then mm-hmm. Cannon Fodder, then sensible world of soccer then kind of for the two then sensible golf and then we had to move on to 3d which we did a bit less successfully and we put out sensible soccer 98 and that was about it and then we kind of like we realized at that point that we'd been running the company 13 years made quite a lot of money and weren't capable of doing 3d software very well so we just kind of stopped and then after that i um we sold sold the company to code masters I personally went over to move to Codemasters for, I had a year and a half time with my contract. I enjoyed working there, so I worked there a year and a half longer, so I stayed three years at Codemasters. And then I realised I hadn't had a proper holiday break from work from 16 years, and it was about time to have a break, so I gave myself like three months of, I watched the World Cup, every single game on the television. It was it was amazing. And then another, <laughs> yeah, it was really, really timed, timed around the World Cup. And then, um, and then uh, I... Uh, slowly started a consulting business for a while trying to help small companies out which was interesting but didn't make much money mm-hmm. and then myself and two guys from the bitmap brothers so mike montgomery and john phillips set up tower studios which is my current company which we set up in 2004 mm-hmm. and we did mobile games we did a mobile version of sensible soccer we did a mobile version of cannon fodder we did a mobile rugby game called uh, british lions rugby game uh we did a mini golf game which unfortunately didn't make it all the way mm. but then we realized we were all doing consulting as like experts in game like me i do consulting for game design and for, for business i do contracts and games and game design uh and mike and john are both technical programmers and we're all doing consulting and making more money from that than our mobile games work so we stopped and uh i continued doing that up up until about the end of 2008 Eight, I was doing consulting and building up a really nice business. It took a while. It took about two years to build up a really good clients. Unfortunately, at the end of 2008, which was the, the crash, yeah. the, the financial crash, yeah. I had three clients pay me good money and I lost them all in one week in December of 2008. 
So I'm like, Ouch. okay, okay, time to change again. But <laughs> I'm, I'm a game industry guy. I mean, it changes every few years. You're, you're constantly changing, you know, from 8-bit to 16-bit, 3D, that didn't work. Set up a mobile company, then did some consulting, and then business and mm. development and work for developers, for publishers, for backers. I mean, I'm, I'm used to being flexible. So I'm like, okay. Yeah, but yeah I mean, you, you say it changes, but it actually, it, it depends on the person because you are flexible, but uh, not everyone is like that, right? So, you have are to you is, is that is that part of your if of, of who you are of who you've always yeah, been? Or if you're not flexible in this industry, you die. I mean, mm. like we tried to go to 3D from Sensible, we couldn't. We weren't set up as a company to do that very well. We failed, um, but at least we tried. But I mean, mm. if we'd have stayed at 2D, we'd have died. I mean, there was no market for 2D games, you know. Yeah. And I guess I'm a game designer. I'm not. A, I'm not a programmer. I'm an artist. I mean, I can do 2D art pretty well. I can't do 3D art. I've never really been in the game to do 3D art. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can do music. That's easy. And I can do other stuff, but I can't do programming. So when you're a programmer, you've pretty much got a such a good vocation. You can move it to different things. But as a designer, you need to know the business. You need to know, for example, now. I mean, I've done one game with free to play mechanics, but my weakness is I've not done enough free to play game mechanics as a designer as a whole designer yeah. despite the fact i've made 100 games and i can design really well but the the platforms and the uh, monetization systems and that they're always changing and this is what the consulting's taught me so i went from 2000 2009 when all my consulting collapsed i'm like okay at that time you'd had touch phones taking off from about 2006 and you had games like angry birds really going up yeah. and you know it's like oh well we've got a new world because there was a there was a gap between 1995 and 2005 where you couldn't sell any original games everything was licensed tie-ins and sequels and so many people i work with very unlucky they started their career in the mid 90s and they'd had just 10 years of their games being canned like mm-hmm. not coming up very depressing and i always realized i was lucky to be starting the 80s when it really was, if you were good and talented and, and the market was so open to new ideas, and as an ideas guy, that was great, you know, and working with good technical guys around me, brilliant people like Chris Yates, who was my partner then, and the other guys working with us at Sensible, we could really spin out interesting stuff creatively. And then you hit this dearth in the, like I say, from about 95 to 2005. And then the advent of touch phones and the advent of the App Store unlocked the ability f- for developers to be able to publish themselves without mm-hmm. a, without a publisher, but more importantly, to bring the games to market. Because what had happened is, previous to that, everything was in a box. Now, a box has a cost. Like, yeah. to manufacture that box, to print the the um, manual, to create the disc, to make the box, to cellophane wrap it, to put it on a pallet, to take it in a lorry, to drive it to a warehouse, to take it to a shop to sell it. <laughs> That costs money. It costs That's true. Like, That's true. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe people don't don't see that, but like 55% of the money that was spent on games in the box all went to these, these processes, the various mm-hmm. physical processes. So because of the cost of manufacturing a box, if you wanted to make like 100,000 copies of a game and it costs, I don't know, five pounds to make the unit, you need 500,000 to invest just for yeah. your stock. So, so publishers just wouldn't buy these and wouldn't make it because when you've got digital, we're so used to digital now, but pre-digital, everything had a physical investment of costs mm-hmm. of making the stock, which was good and bad. It was bad because it didn't allow new games to break easily. It was actually good because it stopped loads of rubbish getting into the market, which we've now got. So it was a gatekeeper. Actually, the cost <laughs> was a gatekeeper, which we're now struggling because we've lost. So it had pluses and minuses. But anyway, I decided 2009 to, to 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 look at this new market, which was mm-hmm. kind of like a digital version of which what I was familiar with from the 80s in my, my mind, uh, and um, found a contract on this weird app called Memotes, which was a, like a, a messaging app where we you took a 3D avatar of someone's face using some high technology from some New York police department, and anyway, that didn't go very well because <laughs> the guys who commissioned it said you needed an AOL account in order to be able to play it, which kind of just killed it. Yes. Okay, yeah, it. obviously, yes. An American <laughs> client that was a little behind the times, very nice guys, but that, that kind of killed it stone dead. What's your AOL, you know, yeah. <laughs> bin? And, uh, anyway, so um, 
So then we did a version of Speedball, the old classic bit maps game, mm -hmm. um, which uh, working with Mike, of course, Mike's a very close friend of mine anyway. Um, and um, we we did that with a, I, I worked with a team in Poland called Vivid Games. So we did four or five games together. We did, did that. We did my original word game, Word Explorer. We did one of their games called Shoot to Kill. We did another thing, one of their games. Um, and that was about five years of working with them, which mm -hmm. taught me self-publishing. Okay. It taught me that even though Smeagol got to number one and I was the publisher, I uh, didn't know. I knew I, had to, I could get it to number one. I couldn't make it stick at number one because there's a whole skill around marketing and that kind of stuff, which just isn't my bag. So it was good because it taught me about how publishing works. and the, mm -hmm. the, the, how, I've always known it because I've worked with publishers for my whole career. I work with many, many of the best publishers like Ocean, like I said, um, Virgin, um, Renegade. When I was there, they were brilliant. Mm -hmm. Codemaster was great to work with. So I was used to working with these companies and I was aware of what they brought to the table. And but I've always from the perspective of the developer, not the publisher. Yeah, but I mean, some developers see publishers as enemies and I've never really seen them as that. I've seen them, always seen them as partners. It's partners, like, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you just find the right fit with people and, you know, a good publisher a good publisher will have a good portfolio of products. We'll look after the products. We'll look after the people that work with them. We'll put money in, um, provide marketing and provide access to the market. And then the developer can focus on the development stuff. Now, of course it is possible to do all those functions, but a lot of startup teams, they try and take on all of it at once. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of specializations there and you won't have any, the, the problem if you, if you really don't know what you're doing is you don't know that you don't know what you're doing. So you, you think you're doing stuff and you're like going to have 5% of it. And for example, a very experienced salesperson is such an asset to have or a very experienced marketeer who knows how these things work. And um, I mean, I found that, okay, I've got a reputation that I can go and speak to a, a website or have an interview or whatever. Well, those things yeah. aren't so prevalent, prevalent these days. Um, interviews is more like branding teams, pushing brand awareness and stuff. Is it, different way like social media and stuff so yeah more like uh viral things that that yeah viral marketing that's created around the product so yeah so it, it depends on the public as well the audience specifically so maybe if you're catering to like a more let's say mature not to yeah. say old uh audience like myself for example yeah, yeah. maybe your name or a, a reputable name will get you through the door and oh you get my attention, but for maybe younger audiences uh, who are not so aware of, you know, what games were like in the eighties, in the nineties, it's all about the the marketing and the, the social media strategy, right? I think I think it's um, I think what's quite strange at the moment we've got on one hand a massive celebrity culture, celebrity and all stuff. On the other hand, we've got less of an artist based culture. So. The way that we used to, us and other companies like us in the 80s and early 90s, used to promote our stuff. We do interviews with magazines predominantly, um, but also occasionally TV or radio or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were very much marketed as teams, as artists, like a band would be, or like a singer would be, or, you know, like this way. And this is the way I'm used to working. It's the way I'm used to being actually represented. And the advantage of that from the from from our perspective, from a developer's perspective, it's free. I just someone invites me, I turn up, I talk for half an hour, an hour, cost nothing. You get your message across as you want, and that works. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you make a video, you have less control over it, then you spend a fortune making it, pushing out into channels, blah, 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 blah. So what's actually happened is Whereas the old way of doing stuff would be people like you who are interested in the culture of this and the people around it, talking to people like me who are interested in talking about what we've done and the work and how we've made it. Mm -hmm. And then the cons uh, the, our consumers, our viewers, would look at this and go, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that happened in those days or whatever, you know. So fr from your perspective and from my perspective, we build our own persona and career around this kind of either interviewing people or being interviewed or whatever. Mm -hmm. But of course, that doesn't make anyone else a lot of money this no one's making the ads no one's serving the ads no all those people who basically are quite talentless but they're good at shoveling money around and making sure they get a cut of everything mm -hmm. that's really the, the, the heart <laughs> that we're in now, right? so now you think about it 
think about how that works. So you've got this app store which appears, which ostensibly to me at the start looked like the old Commodore 64 or Amiga market. You know? Okay. Here's, here's the reality. Here was the here was the sell in. It used to be 55% went to all this distribution, like I said. Now, all Apple or Google one is just 30%. It's almost half. Mm-hmm. Guess what? As a developer, you can go direct to market. That's great. But here's the reality. Now you've got to market it against 1 million other apps, right? <laughs> and your marketing budget is like 100 times more than it ever was. And all the money is going to the marketing companies. And <laughs> even if you fail, they're still getting their money. Yeah, right? obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and people, I guess for consumers, it might be hard to cotton on to how the whole internal financial market of it is just turned upside down on its head. So yeah, before we would spend 55%, that's right, on distribution. But guess what? We only spent 10% of our money on marketing, not 60, you know. So it's totally turned upside down. Yeah. yeah and yeah. and then you get so many new um, companies coming into it and they're so naive about the process because they weren't exposed to the old processes. They don't understand that the, the whole charade of what's going on to them it's the only reality yeah and us older guys are going my god <laughs> all those advertising guys are some, somehow getting all the money you know and all the channels all you all your googles and amazons and you know all of them they're all playing us we're just content now we're just yeah yeah obviously we don't, and, and if you don't uh, um somehow invest in that part of the business you'll get lost in the sea of new apps and games and stuff that and mm-hmm. The tra- yeah. trashware that that's right. available everywhere, like as you said, like a million apps or whatever it is. It's no, it's more well, now. Yeah. I've always said there's only two types of game worth doing. You either do something original, or you do something the same but a better version. So, yeah. I'll give you two examples of this. One is Bejeweled, and the other one is Candy Crush. Okay, okay. so Bejeweled might not have been the first, but one of the first match three games certainly I ever played back whenever it was. Mm-hmm. Candy Crush commercially definitely the best version of that and a really good really brilliant game i love candy crush it's a great game we don't need a, th- a th- we don't need 10,000 inferior copies of candy crush in the market we need zero of those games in the market right true true <laughs> <laughs> and somehow the system at the moment doesn't want to filter it out now this is a curation issue a good publisher as i said would have a good portfolio of games and try to develop a stable of developers if it couldn't finance all of their stuff or part of the developer. And at the exclusion, this this whole world has gone crazy. Like, I make games. It's a competition. I don't love games. I want my games to be at the top because it's my sport, right? Yeah. To win this. And I'm used to being successful. And I've had a whole bunch of hit games in the past. Mm-hmm. And I... <sighs> I don't want this million apps to all do quite well. I want my app to do well. I don't give a shit about the other apps. It's, <laughs> it's not my thing. You know, if my friends run the companies, yeah, I, I, I'm happy with my friends. I've obviously got lots of friends in the industry. I'm happy when my friends do well, for sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, com- it's a competition. Yeah, obviously. And this, this has kind of been lost in this cuddly kind of, yeah, now we've opened the market to everybody, say all these huge multinational corporations who don't pay tax anywhere and suck the life out of everything and kill small businesses everywhere. You know, this cuddly yeah. face and this kind of like, I don't know, like um, vampire-like attack on everybody and sucking the blood out of everything. And it's so hypocritical. And and suddenly we're all, we're all trapped in this, as you said, where can we go? Like, there's nowhere to go. We all take money from these people because there's no one else with any money anymore. Yeah. You know. It, it kind of, you were saying the, the competition side of things. Uh, it kind of reminded me of uh, like the, like 90s, early 2000s that yeah. uh, we had like companies like going at each other's throats. Like the yeah. marketing was like Sega and Nintendo and Sony exactly, and, yeah. and Microsoft. And, uh, and now everybody's like, friends and uh obviously behind the scenes that's not true they're all competing. i think friends means controlled so there's no there's, the competition keep your, keep your enemies closer right the competition's already been won there isn't any competition anymore <laughs> is what we're saying yeah. and i'm sure if you look at the people backing like the investors backing these companies you probably find they're all the same people anyway 
Yeah. I mean, that is the way it feels our world is going right now, right? It feels like it's going to this mm -hmm. tiny bunch of guys at the top who are like, got their fingers in all the pies that mean anything. I mm -hmm. mean, the whole, we're not talking about games yet, but the whole model really disgusts me. Like, I was going to different countries. I've, I've worked, I've been very lucky I've, in my consulting. I mean, I'm currently, to just to finish my little story, so I did, I did the games with the Polish company. And then in 2015, I made a, a Finnish company called Combat Breaker, a new company but made from old guys who'd been in different companies who'd done their thing. Mm -hmm. And we spent seven years making social soccer with them on different platforms um, and various other companies as well. But I've spent my time, like, work. I spent two years working with a team in Ukraine. I spent five years in Poland. I've been seven years now in Finland. I spent six months in Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. Not always there, but going backwards and forwards, which is what I kind of do, like a homing pigeon. Uh, working all over the UK in like loads of companies, like 10, 15 different companies. And I've got a good feel for like the way development works in different places. I've done, I was work, trying to work with a team in Denmark at some point. That didn't quite happen. Um, and, and I saw this model of these investors and what they do, they get a bunch of people who are just out of college normally. And they go, we can give you 50,000 euros. And they do it like times 10 people. Like, so they give 50,000 euros to 10 lots of people. It's hey, it's this is like betting, spread betting. Like they know nine out of 10 will fail. They know 10 out of 10 might fail. Okay. And then you, I went to see these people in, in Denmark, this was, and I spoke to a bunch of different companies and they're like, yeah, we're halfway through. We've already had 30,000. We know it's not going to work. We're just going to like do the minimum we can and just let it go. And and they're doing that. And then the, the company that's investing in it is doing that. Yeah. But one out of those nine, if it succeeds, now this company's got its claws in them. Now they've only given them 50,000. They're already owning 20 to 30% of their company, by the way. And they know the next thing is we're going places. We need more money. They're like, okay. We could just take a few more shares. That'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and then in order to in order to get to that, you know, to get to that where they need to be, they've lost like some time of their company. Yeah. They've yeah. lost control. And this is how these company the investors are playing it. They're like mm. happily lose money in the dead stuff, let it go, to make sure they control that thing. And then of course later on they'll sell that on. And and that company is very, very often managed in a way where it's consumed by a bigger company, which itself is part of a conglomerate of a really big company, which these guys invested in the small thing in the first place. In the they first place, yes. They just create a cycle. You get it, yeah? That's how I see the world at the moment, you know. It's like um, – and so it's so hard for us to, mm -hmm. to fight this. We have to – we have to live within this. Well, the only way to fight it is a war, which is unlikely to happen soon. That's mm -hmm. probably the only way to fight it. So we have to live within this ecosystem and find our why. And it's never pure. Like I've worked with a bunch of companies and taken money from a bunch of companies I don't particularly like, but they're the only people with money anymore. I yeah. can't go to companies like Ocean so easily and just get money from them because – it's not there in that way. The old publishing way isn't there. And I'm not saying Ocean were perfect or, or Virgin were perfect or Renegade were perfect, but they, they came from a publisher mentality I appreciate and understand as part of mm -hmm. what delivering commercial art is, not of some uh, conglomerate company which is only interested like, in uh, shares and profits and stuff like faceless, that. Faceless uh, company, right? A faceless publisher. You, you, it's not based on relation, but uh, relationships with people and – and who you trust, and they trust you, right? But not, not anymore. It's where the money is. You have to go there and please, okay. Like said, it's like content. Yeah. Like we're now making a video file, like, yeah. you know, like an MP4 or something, and it's going to go wherever, and then it just get lost in this. Yeah, big, yeah. You know, I never used to feel in the 80s and 90s, and even up to 10 years ago, I felt like I was making content, like something which, creatively hopefully it's consumed people enjoy like mm -hmm. look at sensible soccer cannon fodder whizball um shoot my construction kit megalomania these are games people frequently come back and say we loved that it was really good and as an artist you're like great made some good stuff validated myself as an artist also made some money also it was fun worked with some great guys that's really really good this feeling of just making some content to feed into a machine to make a number go up slightly in someone's quarterly shareholding it was like so 
dull and dry and uh, not where any of us lot really are coming from. I think yeah. that I think that it's it, it feels like in a generation this notion of being an artist has been lost. Although I did see a very brilliant musician recently who kind of I've been thinking this for a while. I think that the very younger generation now it's they're coming out of that. I think there's a I think there's a real cynicism for it now. I think now mm-hmm. that there's a zero win scenario for younger people out of that ang- out of that problem is coming a bit more of a drive so i do i do feel like i do feel like there's some hope i think this must go in cycles but yeah mm-hmm. right now for us game makers we you know we as usual we're always controlled by the platform holders yeah uh, yeah. uh and in this case it's not just the platform holders it's it's yeah it's the the other mechanisms and the system itself, the way it's implemented, it's it's hard to break through and it's boring. And break I mean, away it's from really, it as well. Really, really yeah. boring as well. It's mm-hmm. not just it's hard. It's like and, and uh, even even creativity. You you were talking about like the yeah. at some point there were only sequels and uh, yeah, that was that, like period. copies of games. Period. It's, it's yeah. not really that different now. Even new IPs are yeah. somewhat. <laughs> iterations of the same model or formula or it's, you know when, uh, when, you, when you've got how can I explain this I can explain how it happened in the console era which might help so mm-hmm. we had all these original games coming out you know we went from 8 bit to 16 bit 16 bit was a massive jump graphically and then we went to early 3D which is another massive jump with things like, like Mario 64 where we went oh my god what's that Something new has happened, you know. It was like the Sex Pistols had just appeared in your, you know, <laughs> musically. You know, it was like that much of a shock. Um, but what happened at that time in the mid '90s is we also had a dot com bubble, and the dot com bubble meant that there were a lot of tech companies emerging, and the big media companies like Bertelsmann and Warner and Sony, they hadn't really looked at game as software. You know, they'd be they were in music, they were in film, some of them were in hardware in Sony's case, but They'd not really looked at making games as a way of making money, creating IPs. And they all moved in in the mid-90s to this area. And at the same time, the dot-com bubble meant a lot of new companies emerged, basically bullshitting, basically saying, we can do that, when they couldn't do that. And the reason that the reason that they got away with it is because the people who happened to have the money at that time were very new, and they couldn't easily tell the difference between guys like us who'd made a bunch of hit games already, and new people setting up new companies. And mm-hmm. of course, the new people are more pliable and easier to pull around. So any, anyway, to cut a long story short, what happened as a result of that is that a lot of these new companies couldn't deliver the games properly. Mm-hmm. And these and these new publishing companies that come into a new industry um, had their fingers burnt and lost money, and they became very, very cautious because... Uh, they didn't want this to, this to go wrong, and and the way it fed down was also from the retailer. So the retailer, uh, W H Smith in the UK, for example, is going to order in a stock of games, and the retailer says, "Well, we want this, 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 and this." But you know, those other things they didn't sell very well. So it all became an well in the early days, eighties, nineties, game shops were more bespoke hobbyist games run by game enthusiasts. Yeah. Not really so, again, like, no reason. Like, like, like chains and yeah, big corporations and stuff, yeah. Yeah, so the big corporations are more risk-averse. Mm-hmm. So what happened was an interesting pattern of risk aversion. So you've got a store owner who's a game enthusiast buying games from a publisher where normally the person who was buying the games from the publisher um, and who was commissioning these games was high up in that publishing company because it was a small publisher, might have been a, a, a shareholder in the publisher or high up. And what I'm saying is if the game sold really well, they're stood to make a load of money. Yeah. Right? And then you go down to a developer who's also privately owned developers where most people in the company are going to make money. So all along the chain, there's an incentive to take risk. The retailer, the publisher, and the developer. You go that bit further on, that, that 10 years on, now you've got a retailer where the employees are just guys like doing stock buying at Smith's or Game or whatever. And they're like, well, we don't want to make a mistake because the problem 
in that setup is if you make a mistake, you lose your job. But if you make a really good decision, you get no benefit. Yeah. From a business owner perspective, it works both ways. You get the plus and the minus. You could wait, you could lose loads of money, but you could also make loads of money. So you ended up with a, a cautious stock order. And then the publisher who's commissioning games is like, well, is it only point in making that slightly out there left field game if I know that there's a high chance this guy's not going to stock it? In which case, I'm going to lose money, therefore I'm going to lose my job. And because he has, it's not like someone's just given him lemmings and he's like, wow, someone's just given me lemmings and I own half the publishing company and I can make an absolute fortune out of that. This guy's only worried about losing his job, you know. So he doesn't have that incentive to take that risk, to take, to, risk. Yeah. To take the chance on the outlying mm-hmm. title. Mm-hmm. And then they feed the information back to us developers. And the developers, we're trying to push original IP and they're going, no, 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 we, we don't want that. But can you do like Rocky Six? The movie game, you know, and that's what was happening. That's how it. That's how it works, and yeah. and I feel like now, we, now there's quite a lot of that going on. There's quite a lot. Of there is. There is. There, the, the the difference is probably uh, the indie scene is uh, stronger, right? Yeah, although, the indie scene is stronger now. although lots of indies are being like <laughs> also <laughs> caught up. In that, yes, exactly. Yeah. Snatched by other well, companies. If, if you talk to Ubisoft, for example, or, or, or some of the other companies, they're only interested in... So I've been doing this for 40 years nearly now. You make an original game, you get two, three months in, you've got a playable demo, you go to a publisher and you say, do you want to, do you want our game? Do you want to commit some money in to, to take our game on? But if I do that now with a, a bunch of people, that the playing field's different. There's definitely money out there. Getting it released is hard, but there's money out there. But a lot mm. of the companies, Ubisoft are a good example. They're actually only interested in qu- and acquiring studios. So if they want your game, they also want you. They want the whole entity mm-hmm. as opposed to the old model, which was we own a company and we could give Sensible Soccer to Renegade, Cannon Fodder to um, Virgin, uh, WizKid to Ocean and work for all three clients at the same time. Exactly. Much more yeah. stable because one of them is normally defaulting on payment at some point, but the other two are backing him up. So it was a much more better um, way of getting money in, especially with royalty, if you've got royalty streams coming in. Um, and we used to try to balance up our more creative games like WizKid, for example, with our more uh, stable games like Sensible Soccer. Like football's a very mm-hmm. stable earner. Yeah. And we used to try and balance them for that reason. We liked the creative stuff, but we understood we needed – other straight, more straight games that, that we enjoyed making anyway as well. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's the model has changed and you've got always now a plethora of inexperienced business people um, in developers making very odd decisions which aren't to their benefit. Um, and we don't really have a particularly brilliant means of a mechanism of, for example, a means of communicating and advising these developers how to do stuff like the on a, from a business sense as a, as a developer of original games, all your value is in the intellectual property yeah. the game you've made. And you make money from licensing that out to different clients. Like here's a PlayStation version in Japan. Here's a, a Android version, which you can only sell in Bermuda or whatever it might be. You know? <laughs> and all these little deals add up to income streams and they time mm-hmm. out after three years, you get it back, you sell it again. That's how actually how you make money as a games company. But the only way you can do that is from the very start when you're sitting down there to understand that, make sure you're protecting the intellectual property properly. You register yeah. trademarks when you need to. And you know, it's, you can't give it away or sell it. Otherwise you'll lose control and you'll lose the, the revenue yeah. that comes from it. Yeah. And, it, and yeah. it's how you can construct the contract you've got with your publishing partner, how that works yeah. in terms which are good for you and for them. And, and, and a lot of people are very twitchy and nervous about it and that really they don't feel in control of it, which I understand I was in that position myself for years. It took me many years to get this right. But mm-hmm. it's almost like this concept of ownership in the developer and licensing out and the developer having the power is being almost trained out of people. Like mm-hmm. even when people do self-publishing and, and developing, they're still not really entering this world of cooperation, negotiation, and growing. And then there is like 
you talked about like there's companies there that if they want to deal with you, they want to swallow you. They're not, they don't, they're interested in a nibble or a part or a, a yeah. thing like this. <laughs> so I'm quite, I guess, quite passionate about um, teaching good, good young developers or new developers, not oh. young, new developers, how to play these games, how to make sure that, you know, your intellectual property is yours. You control it by contracts. This generates royalty streams. If you want to incentivize all the people working for you to do really well, cut them into the, the profits of it. You know, I would encourage paying royalties. So I sit in the center. I get royalty streams coming in from publishers, but then I've got development partners working with me. And I, I try to make sure that they are incentivized and they're getting benefits by mm-hmm. way of royalties or whatever other, other way of doing it as they're going. Because... I, I want blood from people sometimes for these games, you know? You 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 the only way you get really good games is for people to really put everything they can in. Sometimes. As long as you balance that hard push with being very easy on people in the in easier months, it can work. Um and I know that crunch as people talk about it has been a big minus in the games industry for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people are w- working, I guess, with big companies in big studios where they're never going to get a royalty. But, you know, if your company's on, I don't know, 50% of the money the game's making, what more incentive do you need? You know, if you want to make money, good money, you want that chance to make good money, you've got to, you've got to be willing to sacrifice that a little bit extra. And that's kind of how I like to work with at least some of the people in the, in the team. So mm-hmm. that, um, so that they're going to go the extra mile with you. All of those great sensible games were made using exactly that financial model internally, which is not always visible to people. Oh, but you know, our, yeah, yeah. Our lead programmers mm-hmm. were like they were on thirty percent of the income of the game, one person. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay. So when you've got games that are selling like hundreds of thousands, millions of copies, that's quite good. So, yeah. so. And that's an incentive to give it your all to push harder and yeah. So that when we say, like, "Can you come back two in the morning for the fifth day in a row?" They're like, "Yeah, okay." You know, it's like it's like you. It's it's more fun with, as a as a company making a game when you're kind of in it together. Mm-hmm. It's not very nice to be in a position where, you know, as a, as a, as someone running a development company, you're always taking huge risks. You know, you're very rarely paying yourself proper salary my income goes in like a flat line and then a big peak and then a flat line again and then sometimes a minus line where i'm putting money back in and it's like a very very odd income and over a number of years but it's important that other people that uh, that big win bit that everyone else can enjoy a bit of that as well obviously they'd have had steady money as they're going along so it won't be such a big Mm -hmm. for them but it's in it's a nice feeling to win together. It's like a yeah. team. This is a team game making games, right? So, and if you do it right, your publisher's part of your team as well. Your developer's part of the team. The marketing mm-hmm. guy's part of the team. We're all in it together. We're all out shooting for the for that win. That's how I like to work with people. But it takes a certain mentality when, when people expect things in a certain way, uh, to be controlled in a certain way. That they they're not necessarily that easy with that model. Some personalities don't like it, you know. You know, sometimes the model creates a bit more friction. You know, like you got a a, a programmer and a and a designer and a producer, and we're all like this, three of us all disagreeing with each other about stuff. But that's how you get great results. It's like no one, no one. I used to say, I don't even know we have to say it these days, but as long as no one dies, I don't really care how we get to the end game of a great game. I don't care <laughs> how we get there. I don't care about the problems people are having. At the end of the day, when I can, when you can look back and go, you know, games like Sensible Soccer, which is 30 years old now, and people like it. Well, that came because at the time, we focused on the game. No one was worrying about themselves or blah, blah, blah. Obviously, if there's a crisis in the family, you know, the hours of yeah. flexible hours, you can allow people to, like, take important times out and do stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's about really fighting and prioritizing for the work and dedicating your life to it for a while. And I think that people are kind of losing that at the moment. I see so much communication LinkedIn about bosses and was it bosses and leaders and and it's like just make a f-ing great product and then enjoy the benefits from it. 
And once you've done that, then you can look back and you won't care about the process because when people are still talking about work you did 30 years ago, then you'll understand the value in that. It's not the value in, oh, well, I worked an extra half hour today or, oh, my boss slightly offended me because I said, that's not good enough. Do it again. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't quite get the ambition of people is so horrendously low right now. There's a massive massive lack of ambition the ambition is to be including to feel nice you know mm -hmm. yeah not to make yeah. great great games or whatever else you're making it's such a great feeling to like make something which sticks it's as an artist it's the best feeling but you can't get that back unless you try and you might try and fail a lot of times before you try and succeed and and i i don't know i mean i feel like there's so many sideways superfluous messages being communicated there's no easy way to make something great there's only the hard way mm -hmm. that's it okay okay that's interesting thank you very much for sharing this insight into yeah. the industry we learned a lot i'm sure yeah Radio Sega turned 17 this week, and I'd like to take this chance to share my birthday wishes for the station during this episode of the Sega Lounge. 17 years is a long time, and I'm proud to have been a part of the station in one way or another for all of them. From its humble beginnings as a part-time radio station with a very limited Sega playlist, to what it is now with thousands of songs and several live shows, Radio Sega continues to be the top resource on the internet for Sega music and audio content. So, here's to you, Radio Sega. Happy 17th. I hope to hear you playing the best Sega music 24-7 for a long, long time. Going back a little bit to some of the things you, you've done. So we'll uh -huh. talk about sociable soccer in a little bit as well, uh, which is your, uh, you know, more, more recent project. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, and since this is a Sega podcast, Sega related podcast. Yes. So at some point, Sensible Software started also porting games or doing games for the, Sega Mega, the Drive. Mega Drive at, yeah. the, at the point. So can you tell us a little bit about... Um, First of all, how much involvement from your part was there in that process? Well, me, um, me personally, yeah. <laughs> uh, very, <laughs> very little, actually. So, um, yeah. you know, it's a bit technical, but basically the, the, mm. the, our main our main format in the 16-bit era was the Amiga. The Amiga, yeah. Now, we were probably the dominant developer in Europe on the Amiga, I would say, for a few mm. years um, at some point in the, in the 90s. Um, we were actually, our games, a combination of our games, Sensible Soccer, California, Megalomania, were number one for 52 weeks in a three-year period, from June 92 to June 95. So we were a proper, for that period of time, that three-year period, like a real mega hit, like a mega hit band or something. Yeah. And all of those games, because there were 68,000, we, we did internally uh, putting to uh, Atari ST and to Sega Mega Drive. Obviously, Sega Mega Drive had a slightly different controller, but um, we with our PC conversions and with weird stuff like Jaguar and things we did, we, we put them externally, but we, we always did in-house the, the, the Sega Mega Drive versions. And I would say of all the console versions, they were the best ones. So if you look at there's a there's a there's a Sega Mega Drive, one of those one of those weird hand controllers with all the games inside, you know the ones I mean? Yeah. Yeah, there's 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 one with two controllers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which has got Megalomania and Cannon Fodder and Sensible Soccer in it, and they were our best games that got ported to Mega Drive. Yeah, really okay. conversions. Okay, okay, excellent. Um, and there, there's a specific game that I read about that uh, the credits for this game. So the the game is World Championship Soccer Two. Yeah, yeah. Right, and the credits for the game was developed by the Mystery Chefs. Yeah. Which I, I think now some people at least know that uh, who the mystery chefs were. You were one of those. Well, we <laughs> one of the we were the sensible software were the mystery chefs. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yes. Exactly. Why? Why the mystery? 
well, both in the name and the process of <laughs> <laughs> development. We were, we were working with them, some of the guys from Sega, and they wanted a football game. Um, mm. uh, we, we managed to be able to repurpose this, the Sensible Soccer engine to make it mm. look like a different game. Um, okay. But it plays like Sensible Soccer from a from from a side on angle rather than an overhead angle with bigger characters. Mm. Uh, and we didn't want to uh, in any way confuse our public with Sensible Soccer, which was like doing really well at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one of those things where in those days, you know, Sensible, we had lots of hit games that we didn't really make good money until Sensible Soccer came out in 92. Mm. And we were f kind of flavor of the month. And so we really cashed in by signing every contract we could, could around 92, 93, 94, 95, when we finally were like, a, everyone wanted a bit of us. And we were very happy to take their money after doing seven <laughs> years of apprenticeship, of having hits and never really making. We had okay money to survive, but nothing really great. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the things, you know, it was a, it was quite a fun thing to do, actually. Yeah, Excellent. Because it tied, tied in with the, the 94 World Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So that was like an officially licensed game. I think by U.S. Gold, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but then Sega put out international uh, world, world Championship Soccer yeah. 2 as like a tie-in for that. Yeah, yeah, it was just one of those, you know, I mean, I've made, I've worked on so many different football games people don't know about um, in the background doing consulting and stuff. And uh, But this one, actually, particular one was all my, it was Chris, I think, mostly, my, my business partner, Chris. Mm -hmm. Um I had very little to do with this one. There was nothing I could do. It was it was a it wasn't really a design job in there or an art. A, actually, the art was done by Stu Cambridge, I think, who's um, the other artist at Sensible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's nice. That's interesting. Interesting, like the and the mystery, truly mystery behind chef. it. Yeah, the mystery, the mystery the chefs. Yeah. I I like that 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 name. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. So um, obviously your your big project now is sociable soccer. Yep, correct. Right? So how does it relate to sensible soccer? Good question. Okay, and now it's it's been a few years of development, and the game's been out on Apple Arcade, and people yep. have been playing it. So now, from a, a different perspective, maybe a few years have gone by. How does it relate to? Sensible oh, I can talk. I can talk about the game a little bit and how it relates. Mm -hmm. So the game has been in development seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, we started off aiming at PC and consoles. Uh, we hoped to get a Kickstarter. We couldn't really get it off the ground. We put a very early access version out in end of 2017 on Steam, um, which isn't out anymore. Um, but we've always been aiming at a totally cross-platform game. So with my heritage and sensible. You know, once you've got a good IP, you put it on as many platforms as you can. Like we just talked about the Sega Mega Drive version of Sensible Soccer and Cannon Fodder and all these. So for me, it was natural that we, we aim for PC, console and mobile. But we weren't too fussed on the order. Uh, the order was dictated by the order the contracts came in with publishers. So actually, the first contract to come in was from a Chinese mobile publisher. So we went, OK, we'll take our base code, which was PC was the central version but we'd always supported the mobile, so we had both, PC and mobile. Mm -hmm. We were like, all right, let's really focus on the mobile now. So we went Chinese. We changed these weird colors, color schemes for cards, very aggressive card pack purchasing, very Chinese economic model. But the game was actually never released in, in China because the, the publisher was always changing his mind about what he wanted to do with publishing. Uh, anyway, and then a year later, we got an offer from Apple from via a discussion I'd had with an American publisher called, called Rogue, um, mm -hmm. uh, to, for a deal with Apple Arcade, and we worked with Rogue with Apple, and we Rogue kind of had good knowledge that Apple Arcade would be needing these sports titles with with online play, uh, and we had that available with 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 Sociable, and so we signed with Rogue, which was great, and that's been out for three years now. Initially, we did really really fantastic. Well, it's plateaued a bit now, but it's Pocket Gamer called it the premier mobile football action game i think in 2019 mm -hmm. or whenever that version came out so that's really very nice might have been the 2020 version they said that about and um and that's been keeping us ticking over and and the money we made from the apple side because we didn't make a lot of money in the chinese side has enabled us to like really throw everything into the pc console which is where we started so we've just got the pc version now which is very 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 close to completion 
Um, and we've added the FIFA Pro license. So in terms of content, obviously in the sensible soccer days, we could put all the licenses in free. These days, that's not the case. <laughs> so actually, we've been um, working uh, closely with FIFA Pro uh, about getting the license into the game, which we succeeded to do. Uh, this now means that 13,500 of the players in the game are now licensed, so we can use the names and the images, which is a pretty huge deal. Um, nice. Uh, the game has got a thousand clubs and about twenty seven, thirty thousand players in it. So it's a very big, sensible. So in that case, it's very much like sensible world of soccer. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's also got more modern elements like online play. So you've got online ability to play like matches online, which obviously we couldn't before. Um, of course, you can also play on your couch against your friend if you want, or on your own against the AI. Um, the team, the way the teams are grown, you. It's from cards, which came from our Chinese thing. So basically, you get player cards, you upgrade them, very much like uh, FIFA's been doing with Ultimate Team. So you take a card and you grow it, um, and then you can sell it on and get a new one in. Um, mm -hmm. We have a 1,000 clans in the game. Every club is a clan. You represent your clan playing for your clan. So all your, all the, are you a football fan? Yeah. Which team? Sure. So I'm Portuguese, so I'm from Benfica. Benfica, I'm Benfica yeah. fan, yeah. Right, so you, you'd, you'd naturally join the Benfica clan and then occasionally you'd have like Benfica, like every day we have a match of um, clan A versus clan B, which goes okay. into the Champions League like groups. We might have Benfica versus Sporting, for example, like kicking uh, around. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you'd have like a 24-hour match and the tug of war bar goes backwards and forwards to choose, to, to, to deduce who's the best player. So that kind mm -hmm. of thing's in the Apple Arcade. Uh, we've just... Like I say, really, it's exciting what we put into the PC version. So we've just added these, like, player models. We've upgraded them a lot. So the, the idea is that we have the, the player license. So you get a card with a with with a football head in it. Like, oh, I've got one sitting here. Like, like something like that, you know, classic football card. Okay. And then and then from that, we, we generate, like, a, a 3D model, like a Fortnite-style model of this character. Okay. So you might get these three guides, guys, the cards as rewards, and then they'll all turn into these three new Fortnite models. Okay. And that becomes your team. Uh, and then, of course, you upgrade those and play different matches, playing for yourself, mm -hmm. playing for your clan. There's 10, there's 10 divisions in the online league system. Um, there's, a, like I said, about 1,000 teams in the clan system. There is... 70 or 80 real world tournaments to win. So we go into quite a lot of depth. We've now got okay. four leagues in countries like Poland and Sweden and the countries we didn't have before, which is quite nice. And mm -hmm. obviously we've got Portugal, uh, Spain, England, Italy, France, a slightly weird version of Germany, America, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, Korea, China, Japan, etc., etc. Okay. So yeah. um, it's a big football world. It hasn't yeah. got all the components of SWAS yet. It doesn't have the free player market in it yet because we only signed the FIFA Pro license very recently and we didn't have any need for it. You don't, there's no point in having a full player market of made-up name players. There's no value. So it's something over time we want to put these kind of things in and different commentary systems. And it, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a soccer series. So it's like PC and console will be out this year. Probably PC before console, maybe not. We mm -hmm. start with our publisher on that. And then we look at going to the code base and then we look at building towards regular mobile release on top of Apple Arcade, which will be sometime next year, probably. Okay. So, but this is always a moving feast. Like these dates have been moving back and back and back. I know people have been following us <laughs> frustrated. Development has been slow. We've lost time mainly due to technical reasons, actually. But it's mm -hmm. enabled us to inquire things, acquire things like the FIFA Pro license, to build a better animation system and these player models out. Um, so yeah, we're kind of in a pretty good place. And so what, what's the goal here? Because uh, I think there are like two uh, trains of thought here. Some people prefer like the, the, the simulation side of things and others prefer like a more arcadey gameplay. Um, where would you place sociable, sociable soccer? Sociable soccer is very much from the gameplay school of sensible soccer. 
I mean, if you're a sensible soccer player, it's not the same, but you will be able to pick it up and play very easily. Mm-hmm. What we've been careful to do is make it so that also FIFA players can quite easily pick up and pick it up and play. So we tried to take some of the more basic FIFA controls, which will be the default way people pick up and play it, probably because most of mm-hmm. them have played FIFA in the last 20 yeah. years. Uh, but also with the gameplay response, a bit more like sensible soccer. So player selection is more like sensible soccer. The ball bending and that kind of stuff. The speed is more like sensible soccer. The matches are three minutes. You don't watch Ronaldo preaming his hair for like six minutes before the game kicks off. Um, <laughs> it's more direct stuff, which is actually better okay. booted for online play, which needs to be fast. So um, it's kind of, it's not got all those features. Like I say, we haven't got the ability to edit your own tactics like we had in SWAS yet. Um, mm-hmm. We don't have the free player market yet. Um, we'd like to add two versus two. We haven't done that yet. So this is a series on, <laughs> by the time we finish the mobile, it will be, it's, it's in development on 10 platforms simultaneously. Yeah. So that's quite a lot. So we're always adding platforms in, adding features in, tuning what we've got. And then once we settle down to a release pattern, it's going to be, you know, a full release at the start of the football season, a six monthly data patch for all the, transfer market, you know, transfer mm-hmm. window uh, and probably bug fixes of things which didn't quite work or retuning or whatever. So we're just getting to that point now where we're we're adding all the PC and console platforms into the mix because Apple Arcade, you already support three. You already support the um, iOS, Apple TV and the Mac. That You need yeah. to do that for Apple mm-hmm. Arcade. Uh, plus now we've got PC on Steam and Epic, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X and Switch. And then when we do the uh, full mobile, you have iOS and Android as well. So it's a lot. And every time you add something new, you have to add that new thing to you've all the platforms. So. You've got it. And, every, <laughs> and some of them, at the, at the moment, one of the key decisions for us internally is because Apple Arcade has been, um, it, you can't have any in-app purchases. You can't have ads. Like they, they ban these things. Mm. So it's very much suited to the premium kind of model that we've got in the PC oh, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. moment. But then we're looking at what can we build in for monetization on the mobile side. Like one option is to go premium, but that's not really very prevalent these days. Or mm-hmm. uh, what's the best way to put features in which can span these formats, not just technically, but also, you know, monetization wise, you know, because it, playing. I don't know, a bunch of money up front for a unit, which is what you'd be doing a PC console, is different from the mobile, the, the regular mobile model. So we're looking at the best ways of doing that. Um, we can support cross-platform play, by the way. The only thing blocking us would be platform holders not playing ball, but we've, you know, we've, there's, there's really, must be weird for people to be following the title because it feels like we've done, to them, like we've done nothing. It feels like to us, we've done nothing but this for seven years. Um <laughs> So it's been a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been an interesting. It's been a process, journey. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, basically, basically, we've had some technical issues, different technical mm. issues along the way, some mm. quite severe ones, um, which haven't deterred us; they've just slowed us down, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for yeah. people waiting for the PC and console versions, uh, rest assured, twenty twenty three. Twenty twenty three. If it doesn't come out twenty twenty three, from where we are now, I mean. <laughs> I'm not going to be happy at all. <laughs> the only thing it would stop us doing it if there was some major change of heart from the publisher side that they said, you know what, we want to wait to get this. You know, we've already been waiting to put Thief Pro in. Okay. That's caused a delay, but it's a worthwhile delay, right? Mm-hmm. So unless there's another seismic Thief Pro style shift in, yeah, but we've just got this to put in and it's some can't possibly miss thing. We're okay. very close to the PC now. Mm-hmm. And the, mm-hmm. the the consoles are going that they port from it, and they're they're porting stage. They're probably about two thirds complete now. But now the, mm-hmm. the consoles need to wait for the PC to be complete so we can finish the porting process. Yeah. And then that needs to go through the manufacturing and the you know the gatekeeping and the box ticking exercises with Sony, with Microsoft, and with Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, unless something okay. goes badly wrong, it will be talking this year. Excellent. And so to, to be clear, it's not a free to play game, right? So it's like, it's not free to play on PC and consoles. It's not free to play. Okay. 
absolutely not. No, um, there never was any intention to do that. Mm. Um, Apple Arcade, which is of course our current model, you know, that's a kind of like Netflix is like a subscription service. It's a yeah, yeah, very yeah. old model for the games industry. But um, yeah, I mean, we are, no, we're not intending a free to play thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. there might be some kind of monetized content at some point added in, but on launch, it won't be there because mm -hmm. we haven't made it yet and we haven't got time to do it. So I don't want to add it now. <laughs> um, and, and then we're going to do a, then we're going to do a bunch of code refactoring. So there's a bunch of technical debt in the code uh, to, mm -hmm. to deal with after that. And then once we've done that, we'll start to look at the next features running for PC console, how we're going with mobile. You know, we've got some ideas how we might want to monetize the mobile side and some mm -hmm. of the features from that may be appropriate to take across or, or not. Um, that's how you have to view it. Okay. Like I said, like I said at the start of the interview that the games market is always changing. You know, it's a seven year development cycle. Where everything's turned totally on its head in those seven years and it will continue to change. So the approach has got to be when you want to do a big cross platform title to be open to different ways to bring the game to market, different monetization fashions, different platform limitations, et cetera, et cetera. It's just mm -hmm. part, part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we usually do here on the Sega Lounge, mm -hmm. John, is a thing I like to call the Sega Lounge Challenge. Okay. Now that you know our guests, it's time to put them to the test. It's the moment we've waited for and the moment they dread. Welcome to your doom. I mean, welcome to the Sega Lounge Challenge. <laughs> and it can be anything I want because every guest is a different guest, it's a different person, it has mm -hmm. different experiences. So what I thought we'd do, if you're up for it, is a thing I like to call the not-so-sensible quiz. Okay, we can do this. Okay, yeah. so what, what's the not-so-sensible quiz? Uh, I don't know. You, you could be, I, I, I guess you, you're going to be amazing at this. I have 10, um, like, football facts here. Okay. Uh, mostly winners of Premier League, um, European Champions League, uh, and Europa League. So okay. winners of these competitions in different seasons. Okay. Seasons might be my weakness, but yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. these are important years for from a, a sensible a software and sociable soccer uh -huh. point of view perspective. So uh, I, I have them numbered one to ten. Would you like to go yeah, from one to ten or let, let random? Let's do it. Let's do it, yeah. Let, one to ten? Okay, so number one. Uh, this is important. I think you know why. So the 19, 1966 champions, so the 65 to 66 mm -hmm. uh, season of the Premier League, who were the champions that year? I was born in 1966. Exactly. Um, and I, was, I was six <laughs> months old when England won the World Cup. I was alive. It did have a <laughs> life, but I don't remember it very well. Um, Who do you put your, your, your money on? I know that the FA Cup <laughs> final was... Everton and Sheffield Wednesday that year. I don't know who won. Mm. Premier League champions. In 66. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, who did we have then? We had West Ham and United. I would go for, I don't know. If, I'll go Manchester United. Okay. Final answer. Yep. Incorrect. Liverpool. Liverpool. Okay. Liverpool. Okay. Number two. Uh, still Premier League champions, uh -huh. but now we're going a, uh, a little bit forward to 84. That's the year I was born. So 83, 84 champions. It won't be Premier League because um, it didn't exist until 92. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the equivalent. The equivalent of 84. Premier League. 84. Right, 84. <laughs> Let me think. So this is, I am 18. It might be the year when Michael Thomas scored a last-minute winner at Anfield in one of the most incredible finishes to a, a top-division season that's ever existed. So I'm going to go Arsenal. You're going to go Arsenal. Yeah. And your answer is? Arsenal. Incorrect. 
it's Liverpool once again. I don't like Liverpool. I'm not going to say Liverpool is the answer. <laughs> you know, I've got to say my weaknesses remembering years and all these things. When it's what year, I'm like, you know what? Mm, not how my brain's work. So, I'm I'm a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, Sensible Soccer, 93. Right, 92, 93. 92 we so, released, June 92, yeah. I do remember okay. that. Okay, yeah. so the, the 92, 93, uh, I, I think, I'm thinking 93 because of the Mega Drive version. So, yeah. uh, Premier League champions, 92, I can 93. give you the top three, Manchester United, Aston Villa, Norwich City. Norwich is my team. We finished third that season. I can't forget it, yeah. United won the league. United won the league. Annoyingly, That's- we had a game <laughs> against them. We were top in April, like a month from the end. And they beat us 5 nil or something. It was dreadful. Ouch. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, easy one. But well done. Well yeah. done. Okay. Same year, mm-hmm. Champions League. Champions League Ooh. winners. Ooh. 92 <laughs> was the year we launched the game. And who won the Champions League? I'm going to go AC Milan. Mm-hmm. Could be, could yeah. be, but it's not. It's, it's Marseille. Oh, Marseille! That was yeah, a nil-nil on Marseille. penalties win, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> win on I actually don't have the results here. I I actually checked the scores when I was making this, but I forgot to. Uh, I have one of two of them here. Mm. In case you want to check, but this one I I don't have. Just, ha- I just, don't know. just have I, the, I, the winners. I think it was one of the. I know Star Bucharest was nil-nil on penalties, and I think that might have been a similar. Probably, probably. Yeah. Okay. Number five, 94, 95. So the year Cannon Fodder was released on the Mega Drive. Uh-huh. Okay. Premier League champions. 94, 95. Okay, so now we're in the era when we've got United and Arsenal. We haven't, I'm going to go Arsenal because we haven't had it yet. And it can't be United again. So I'm going to go Arsenal. <laughs> You would be surprised. It's not Arsenal. Blackburn Rovers. Why is Blackburn's year? The year that Chris Sutton moved to Blackburn. Okay, yeah. Blackburn. Yeah. Okay. Same year, Champions League. Hmm. This is really hard. It's hard because of the year. It's really, really, you're yeah, the year. How can I, I know some people? Finally. Some people have like a, an encyclopedic knowledge yeah. of, of these things. I, I'm like, really bad at years. I've, I've, I know it's forever. hard. I know my. I don't, I don't even remember what happened in my life. Yeah, there you go. In some of these years, yeah. <laughs> like 94, so, 95. I could tell you, ninety four is when we released Swas. Ninety five. That might have been the same. Period for sensible golf, maybe 94, 95. That's how my calendar works in my yeah, head. yeah, yeah. Um, 94, my youngest daughter was born, so she'd be just outside Excellent. the 94, 95 season. She was born in July. Um, mm. who won the Champions League in 94, 95? Let's think who's my choice from. Well, you got you've got the general, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give uh, you a hint. Yeah, go on. It's a, a European. No, I'm. I'm European team. Uh, yeah, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not from the like the five. What do they call them? The big five. Okay. Uh, the major championships. Okay. The major then we've got. Let, let me think of the outlying countries I can think of. The one. We've got ah, oh, including we could include Portugal. We could include Porto. We could have Star Bucharest. We could have Red Star Belgrade. I know this stuff. I just don't know the year to pin names to. <laughs> um, who else could we have that's won it? Um, um, Celtic won it in the 60s, but it won't be there. Mm. Um, so it's not English, Italian, French, German, or Spanish. Um, I don't think Benfica has won it that recently, unless I... My history nope. is wrong. No. Like it, they when it when it was like the European Club mm-hmm. Championship, right? It could could be Ajax. Could be. Mm-hmm. Or a Dutch. I, I can't remember. I don't think PSV have ever won it. We're Champions League, right? 
Yep. Um, I'm so gonna, if if you had to pick one, if I had to pick one of those, right? Let me think. Red Star maybe, Belgrade. Maybe one, one of those that Red you just Star, said. Maybe. No, Star Bucharest. Beat if, if you wanted just to pick one of those that you Let just me mentioned, Star Bucharest. I believe beat Barcelona in the final. Nil on penalties. I think Terry Venables was the manager. Um, I'm going to go. So I'm going to go with them. Star Bucharest. Yeah, you just before before we I, I asked you like to 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 pick yeah. one. You you mentioned some some random team from a random country, like like a random Dutch team or something. You got Ajax. That is correct. Well done. <laughs> that is the correct answer. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Okay, going back one year, ninety four, ninety three, ninety four Premier yeah. League. Oh, second season of the. Premier League, Blackburn won it. Then, I believe Leeds won the title of the season before the Premier League existed. So I'm we've, have to go we've with established. Have to, we've have we've to established. Go to 92, 93, United. United. I'm gonna have to go Arsenal. Yeah. 93, 94, 95, Blackburn Rovers. 93, 94. I'm gonna have to go Arsenal. They're gonna have to win it sometime around then. Arsene Wenger's going to have to have his day at some point in this story. Was it a bit too early for Arsene or were we on the money? United. <laughs> oh, you think, see, I'm British, right? I'm British yeah. and I support Norwich. And most British people, all I've lived through is the 70s of Liverpool dominating and the 80s yeah. of Liverpool dominating. The 90s United, I hate both those teams. And I'm never going to say Liverpool or United <laughs> voluntarily. It's just not going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> I can tell okay. when I was a young boy I used to put Arsenal when I was a boy I had an Arsenal show when I was seven I can live with Arsenal but United and Liverpool please I understand from a from a so it's it's not a, it's not a colour thing it's like it's not that's not the issue here so you, you, you can see Arsenal I'm, you just I, I am not alone United and Liverpool are not people of my age it's like you watch them <laughs> win everything for 25 years you hate them you know I, I I understand. I understand. <laughs> I feel I feel the pain. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The last three ones uh-huh. are from the same season. Okay. okay. Uh, eight, uh, 2018, 2019. Okay. When Sociable Soccer released on the Apple Arcade. So. 19. Okay. 19. 18, Premier League. 18. Oh my god. Oh, we're 23, so we're going back four years. So we've had mostly Man City. We've had a little bit of Chelsea, but I think Chelsea haven't won it for a few years back. We had Liverpool winning for the first time ever, which I think was two seasons mm-hmm. ago. Leicester as well? Leicester, well. Leicester was before that, I think. Was it Was it before that? Yes. I'm going City. City. Correct. Well done. Good. Yes. Woo. Yes. Okay. Champions League, same year. 18-19. Mm-hmm. Champions League finals. Recent Champions League finals. Hang on a second. When did that take place? That took place in 2019. 20, 2019. Right, now yeah. I know the answer to this because my sister had her 50th birthday party on the day that Liverpool played Tottenham and beat them, and I watched it with the Tottenham fan and was crying. So the answer is Liverpool. Okay, it is, yes. There you go. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I could actually tag on to the year to actually find something. That's the difference. See? Thing. Nice. Yeah. Na- the last one, final one. Same year, yep. 19, Europa League. I'm tempted to give... <laughs> an obvious answer because they won it so many times and I don't know the answer outside of that so I'm going to go with Seville because they won it mm. three years in a row I think okay. and I don't know if it's Could maybe be. a bit after the time and I think it's Unai Emery hang on a second hang on a second Unai Emery was the manager when they won it three times I believe mm. I think and then he went to Arsenal after that which was quite a long time ago anyway I'm going to go Seville I've got no other answer 
That is not the correct answer. Who's the correct answer? Uh, very cl- this time you were you would be very close to if you said Arsenal. Yeah, they were Arsenal. the runners up. They they lost four one to Chelsea. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, so it was like a full-on British invasion here. Liverpool, Tottenham, oh, yes, no, Chelsea, right, you're Arsenal. Right. Now you're, I remember. I remember. Yeah. That year. You're right. That was the year <laughs> when we had four finalists. But I wouldn't yeah. have remembered that Chelsea won anyway. So yeah. <laughs> I brought Chelsea out of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> The joy but good job. Standard. This was this was really hard. This it's was hard. Really it's hard because you're giving me not so years. sensible quiz. <laughs> if you expect me name me three clubs outside of the top five divisions who've ever won the Champions League, there'd have been a piece of cake. But yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I could pin it when it was my sister's fiftieth birthday because I had something in my life to pin it on. That was yes, like yes. Well, I remembered being in being in a place watching it in an event on that day. And I remembered being there, you know, that's the only yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Thank you for doing this. Okay. So I have, I have one last question before I let you go. Um, I asked this question to all of my guests. Uh, are you familiar with the, the, the concept of blast processing? No, tell me about blast processing. Okay. So in the nineties, mm-hmm. uh, in the U S the Mega Drive was called the Genesis. Yep. And uh, Sega of America uh, developed like a marketing campaign saying that the Genesis had blast processing. Okay. So it was more powerful than any Nintendo machine that any of the competition, uh-huh. right? So uh, my question is, since whatever blast processing is, uh, is so powerful and makes things faster mm-hmm. and more amazing, If you could add blast processing to anything in the world, what would it be and why? Anything. Anything in the world. I think going back to the very first thing we discussed, I think we add blast processing to every single piece of computer connectivity on the planet for instant, error-free, permanent working connection. I I stand behind this idea. Yes, that's it. That's the one. Vote John Hare. <laughs> that's the one. Or burn that's them brilliant. all down until there's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, John. Thank you very much for your time. Um, it was really really nice to talk to you and have like a, a, an insight into the mind of one of the, the biggest industry legends out there. And uh, hopefully, sociable soccer will be. Uh, a success as well. Hopefully, and hopefully, we can... hopefully we'll do a comeback. We've been saying for years we want to come back like as if Ajax came back and win the championship. <laughs> so this is our aim. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Really hoping to to play that soon. Um and uh hopefully we can we can talk again soon yeah. as well. Maybe yeah, sure. when the next iteration of Sociable Soccer is out. We'll, be we'll have another Thank chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. See ya. That's it for my wonderful chat with John Hare. This got me curious about all the sensible games I hadn't experienced before. Cannon Fodder, it's such a fun little game, isn't it? I definitely recommend you check it out when you can. Next week, we're going for the trifecta. You know how I say we cover everything Sega, be it the games, the music, or the community? Last week, we covered the community. This week, the games. So next up, we have the music. Well, and the community, to be honest, but that's something for the next episode. Join me then for more lounge goodness. Until then, please follow the podcast on your platform of choice and remember to subscribe to our newsletter. The segalounge.com slash newsletter is a good way to do it. Have a great week. Enjoy Steam's spring sale if you're into that sort of thing. And I'll see you all next week. Bye bye The Sega Lounge, hosted by me, KC, and part of Radio Sega's network of live shows and podcasts. Theme song and incidental music by OSC. Find them at opusscienscollective.bandcamp.com. Got any suggestions? 
drop me an email to podcast at thesegalounge.com. Find us at The Sega Lounge on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find previous episodes of the show by going to thesegalounge.com and wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Mixed on Productions podcast.